cool. The baby's Bible class can go off to your celebration. The line keeps saying, you're so cold, I'm regretting wearing a long sleeve shirt. I'm dying of heat. Um, yeah, so just, as, just to, to say what Lauren said, if you can, just book that weekend out. I know some of you are really planning what your January is going to look like. We're really trusting as these numbers start climbing a little bit that by the end of January we will still be able to have a lot of people in the auditorium. If we get put back down to 50 odd people, we'll probably postpone our celebration later on in the year, but we're trusting that we can go ahead with our plans. Well, this morning I'm going to continue with our series in the book of 1 John. So if you have your Bibles or a Bible app, you can turn there with me to 1 John chapter 3. Um, for the next few weeks, I'm going to get um, some other speakers to share. My, my line and myself are off to take a little bit of a break and see a family member that we haven't seen over this lockdown period, over two years, and also just take the opportunity to pray about next year and some of the things that God is saying for us as a church in what lies ahead for us. So I'm going to encourage you to um, yeah, just also pray for us in this time as we just really trust to get a sense of what God is saying. So next week I think we've got Gavin preaching and then Tobiso and Carl will be sharing and then we're also looking forward to having our Christmas service on the 25th if you can diarize that date. I think it's 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock on Christmas morning and then no celebration on the 26th. So Last Sunday, after the church service, we had Craig Rowe come and share, and we were just around the table just talking a little bit about the day, and it came up in one of the conversations that someone knew someone who had given his kidney away to his brother. So that kind of sparked a bit of interest in me, just to go, well, what does it mean to give your kidney to someone else? What are the, if, if we had to just be honest... What are the consequences for me being the one that's giving the, the kidney away? I understand someone might be desperate and need the kidney transplant, but what price am I going to pay by giving my kidney away? I enjoy exercising and I enjoy an active life. Is that going to hinder me from doing the things I love? So it got me asking the question, well, how far am I willing to go when it comes to doing an act of love for someone? Maybe Dr. Karen or someone can tell me, what are those consequences? I think, I think I heard something about maybe you could get higher blood pressure or water retention, but I think it's pretty safe to give someone a kidney. But when it comes to acts of love, obviously it, it requires you giving of yourself to someone else, and there's normally a price that you pay in doing so. And the writer of John is going to encourage us to be quite practical in the way we love one another. So I'm excited about this topic today and I'm trusting that we can not just talk theory but we can talk about some practical ways that we can fulfill this, 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 um, this call, this command that God has for us. So I've, I titled the sermon, Love Does, and I want to start off by sharing a quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer that says this, those who love their dream of a Christian community more than they love the Christian community itself become destroyers of that Christian community, even though their personal intentions may be ever so honest, earnest, and sacrificial. What is he saying here? He says, many of us love the idea of loving one another, but when it comes to actually loving one another, hmm, that's where it gets a little bit messy. We all love the idea of a church that is unified. We come together. There's no need. Um, doesn't matter your race, your color, your age. We all come together and there is just love for one another. And we're in each other's homes and we're doing life together. And there is this picture. He calls it a dream of a Christian community. And we can sit here today and have this dream of this Christian community. But in a sense, I want to really challenge us today on the practical outworking of what it means to love and be a part of a Christian community. John today is going to challenge us when it comes to action, not just talk. You know, there is a problem between the knowing and the doing gap. There is a knowing and a doing, and there is all the space in between. There is this lip service that we can talk the talk, but actually when it comes down to doing it, that's where it's a little bit more challenging. Sam, do you mind turning me a little bit more down, please? 
So if you have 1 John open, please turn to chapter 3, verse 11. And um, if you've been following us with us in this series, you would have realized that John loves looking at comparisons. So we've looked at light versus darkness. We've looked at righteousness versus an unrighteous life. Last week we looked at being a child of God versus a child of the devil. And we're going to today kind of look at this quite extreme example of love versus hate. And he gives this radical example for you to go and for some extra Bible study, go and study the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4, which we're going to read about now in 1 John 3 verse 11. So read with me. I'm, I'm reading from the New Living Translation that says this. This is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil, and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. If we love our brothers and sisters, we're talking about our Christian brothers and sisters, who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you, don't, and you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and our sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and, shows a, and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Verse 18, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. In the last little section, dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence, and we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. And this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with him and with them. And we know he lives in us because the spirit he gave us lives in us. <sighs> Take a deep breath. That was a, a nice long passage, but he's building on some of the themes we have been talking about throughout this book of 1 John. So what is he saying? He keeps talking about these, this commandment. He starts off this passage by saying, you know from the beginning it is said. And then right in this passage, he's going to give another example. And as we've been doing different series throughout this, this year, as we did that series, Words to Live By, one of the topics we looked at is loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, loving our neighbor as ourselves. So he goes in verse 11, and he says, you have heard this from the beginning. And remember, John was there with Jesus. He was one of his closest disciples. He wrote the gospel of John, and now he's writing this letter, 1 John. So a lot of the things he says you'll find in the gospel of John. So a new commandment, love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. The problem with this verse is the way that Jesus loves me and the way that Jesus loves his disciples is where he sets the bar. It's where he sets the standard. That is the uncomfortableness about this particular verse. But he says, the way I have loved you, you go, Peter, John, James, Matthew, and go love one another with that same sort of love. This sounds simple, because then he goes in 1 John, which we just read, verse 3, verse 23, and he again elaborates on this new commandment, and he says, this is the new commandment. One, we must believe in the name of Jesus and love one another just as he commanded us. Again, simply, sounds simple, the actual doing it is a little bit more complicated. 
So we think of love always as a feeling. And I get to do weddings, I'm going to do another wedding, and one of the topics I love talking about is love is just not this feeling. Because I look at this young couple standing there, they are full of feelings. I want to encourage them that those feelings come and go. It's like a wave that goes up and down in life. And actually, God's calling you to love one another with a covenant love, a love that is not just dependent on these feelings. Why is it not just a feeling? Why is it not just this warm, fuzzy thing he's saying that we are to do with one another? Because he doesn't just tell us to love him and our neighbors. He tells us to love our enemies. So he says in Luke 6 verse 27, he says, I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you and bless those who curse you and pray for those who hurt you. It's very hard to love an enemy with just a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. He says, do good. There is an action involved in loving your enemy. So this love is a command to love God, to love people. I cannot command happiness. I wish I could. Kim, be happy. <laughs> that wasn't, you just faked that, Kim. It wasn't real. He, asks, he says this phrase in this passage, you know what real love is. What is that song? I want to know what love is. Who sings that? Is it Mariah? Mariah Carey, no. I wish I could sing it. I want to know what love is. I'm going to ask us, church, this morning, what is it to love one another with this love that Jesus has loved us with? So in verse 16, he gives us this, he gives this statement to the readers, and he says, guys, you know already what real love is. And he says it in verse 6, 3, verse 16. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and our sisters. We sit at the foot of the cross and we look up at the sacrifice that Jesus made. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. And Jesus willingly laid down his life for us as an act of love. And we look at that sacrifice, the way he laid it down for us. And he says, I now want you to lay down your life for your Christian brothers and sisters. And I turn and I face my Christian brothers and sisters and I go, what do you mean lay down my life for these people? And I don't think we, are, or I know we're not in a, a world or a country at the moment where if you profess to be a Christian that you will die for your belief. So it's not like I'm going to st stand in the gap for Fred and say, rather kill me. But he talks about laying our lives down, loving one another. And um, I want to ask this simple question this morning. To us as New Creation Family Church, how do we love one another in a way that it, it echoes the words of Jesus that said, lay down your lives for one another. So I went to our CrossFit box yesterday and we trained at our, our gym called 152. And I don't know if you know anything about the CrossFit community, but they've got this motto that says, come for the fitness and stay for the family. There is a love for exercise that you get, but actually there is a community of people that you join and be a part of, and people stay for the family. So I, um, I've got Jason, he's one of the guys that I train with. Um, he's one of my CrossFit buddies that now comes to church. It's awesome. And we've actually started a life group on a Wednesday night with a whole bunch of other families. Just stand up, Jason. You're like, I'm half the man you are. <laughs> I, f I feel small next to you. Thank you. But, but we, um, we go into this gym and we exercise together. And in a sense, there is community there at the gym. In a sense, people love each other. They stay for the friendships. They stay for the love. And I, and I want to ask the question, how different are we as a Christian community of believers to this CrossFit gym where we sweat and we, we cry and we do that and then they, get, they go and they party hard and they get into homes and they've got friendships and they love one another. I want to know what is different about that to what we have as believers. What is our common thing? 
It's not exercise. It's not eating strict. And um, it is Jesus. That is that thing that knits us all together. So there's that common denominator that we have. But what is this love that we get to share for one another? What does it look like? How is it outworked? I, I want to trust that our love for one another is different compared to the love that they show each other in the box. But the biblical definition of loving a Christian brother or sisters is to lay your life down. Biblical Christian love is sacrificial in nature. The object is the elevation of others. You will continually be setting self aside for the interest of another if we, if we take this idea of laying our lives down for one another. So 1 John 3 verse 18 to 19, let's get practical. He says, dear, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God. As I said, talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. And this guy, Robert um, Kiyosaki, said this, talk is cheap, learn to listen with your eyes. Actions do speak louder than words. Watch what a person does more than what a person says. So let's go back to this verse because this is my, my verse that I want us to land on this morning. And this is the verse that I want to unpackage a little bit. What does it mean not just to say we love each other? So my sister is here this morning. My blood sister. I hope the cameramen are going to manage this for our online church. Who knows that loving a family member is kind of expected of us, right? I'm supposed to love my blood. Sorry, this isn't my sister. <laughs> This is my sister. <laughs> and then I get a brother-in-law too that I'm called to love. But he says the same love that you have for your family, you must now have for your Christian brothers and sisters. So, Lisa, instead of you just, can you come with me? She's not going to forgive me for this, please. <laughs> she now belongs to a life group in this church. And there are people here that you are living community out with. So can you go find someone in your life group? Maybe you can go stand next to Claudia. So he says, take this love that you have, that you would have for your brother or your sister or your family members, and don't just keep it there. Now share it with a wider Christian community of your spiritual family. So guess what? The same love that we are supposed to show one another as brother and sister, he says you show it for another sister in Christ. And, and listen, the, way, the things that I would do for my sister, you must understand, I will do a lot. I'll even give you my kidney if I have to. <laughs> but that same love that I am called to show you, Jesus says, Show it with your brother. And God brings people into your life that he, that he gets you to call your brothers and sisters. And he sets the bar high. He sets the bar not just for us to talk about this, not just the theory of it, but in practice. And I have brothers and sisters who I've journeyed with, I've cried with, We've been through the ups and downs. We've been through the mess of life together because I call them my brothers and I call them my sisters in Christ. I call you my spiritual family. I don't take that lightly when you commit to a body, a local church of people, when you say, I will be joined together. God, you join me together with the spiritual family because we deal, we then get rid of this whole individualistic life that says, I'm just going to come to a service, get what I want, go and live my own life. No, I'm going to come and be joined together to a community 
of believers, and we are going to love one another. Because Jesus says, by this the world will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. Not the way that you love your brother and sister or your mother and your father, but by the way that I love my Christian brother who is different to me, who is not blood. And it gets messy because who knows why, who knows that Matt over here is not perfect. And Matt can have some weird expectations and he can have some real issues and baggage from the past and insecurities and all that comes with Matt. And, he, and God knits my heart together with his and I'm called to love you and you're called to love me. And it's not easy. And we go through church life and people get hurt and people get offended and people move on and we have friendship divorces and we go off and find other friendships and we try and work it out there but he tells us in this passage to not just talk about love but to really love one another we know what real love is and he gives this one practical example of many practical examples in scripture and he says this you ought to give up your lives for your brothers and sisters if someone has enough money To live well and seize a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Firstly, he says to see a brother in need. That word need need talks about necessities, food, clothing, shelter. And he gives a warning and he says, I want you to see your brother or sister. That see, when you look at the Greek word, it talks about to look carefully at the details, research, to do your homework. I know in this country there is so much need and we as a body of believers want to try and make sure the necessities, the needs are met in every person's life and that's why we've got a Barnabas team and we ask for those that have more than enough to give into our Barnabas fund where we've got a team of people that can help meet the needs of people in this church because guess what, Kim, someone in your life group may be fine. But there are others in other, in other life groups that actually are not able to put a roof over their head or find the next meal. But he says to you, how can you look at your sister in need and say to them, oh, I'll pray for you, sister, and when you've got more than enough. He says there, how can God's love be in that person? And he calls us not just to talk about love. And this is why this quote really challenged, challenged me. Don't just have the the theory of what it's supposed to look like, but in practice, we are supposed to love one another. So I've got a question this morning, and I'm going to ask two people with a microphone to get ready. And I want to hear from people in this church, how have you been loved in New Creation Family Church? How has someone practically loved you? I want real life examples. Let's not just, there's a hand. I want, I want two hands at a time because then I want them to go while the one person's speaking, I want the next person to go. So Tracy, you can stand up because John's quickly going to tell me how you have practically been loved. Sure, so mine's actually a, a fairly simple example but it made a huge impression on my life. And uh, so we've been here a long time. And we've got Ann Robinson sitting right here next to me. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Ann and Ron started this church. But um, for me, I remember walking into this church the first few times and I was greeted by Ron, actually, someone in the church. And I, you know, if you ever knew Ron, he had this great smile that sort of lit up the whole world, which was wonderful. And he... I was brought up in an era where you don't hug other men. <laughs> So I was like in Afrikaans, you say, I was like stock staff <laughs> when he gave me this hug. But it kind of caught on, and he did that with me a number of times. And I remember even with, uh, with my own father, who was much the same, who really, you know, we used to shake hands, and that was about it. But, um, you know, I started doing that with my own dad, and I'd, I'd go to him, they lived next door to us at the time, and I'd give him a hug. And he'd also do the same thing. It was all like rigid like this. And then after a while, he started enjoying it. And after a couple of months, when I would go and visit him, 
they were still living next door, as I said, and um, you know, he, would, he would be waiting at the door with his arms open, waiting for me to give him a hug. And it's just a small example, but it was just such a wonderful thing. And uh, so my own sons today always give me a big hug. That's me. Okay, I want two sentences, one minute. Okay, no preaching, Tracy. From me? No, from John. John is a, oh. John, I just, yeah, quickly go. I want to get, get through a few. You're giving me two sentences. <laughs> no. Do you not know me? I love you, Tracy. <laughs> um, I lost my best friend to COVID this year, and I'm used to dealing with things by myself. But the ladies in our, in our group reached out to me, and that was bizarre, because I'm always like, leave me alone. And that was really oh, the one time I was like, oh my gosh, you're in this, Tracy, you're in a church. And these ladies really reached out to me. It was flowers, it was conversations. Pumla realized she needed to talk a lot of rubbish with me just for me to be out of it. So for me, that was love. Awesome. Short enough. I can think of three things. The first one was when I first arrived. I think on the second time we were here, we were greeted by name, by Paul and by a few other people, and that really touched us. Just <laughs> um, I, the, the greeting and the welcome that Gavin has given my daughter, um, and I think that is one of the things that really attracted us here and, and has continued. It wasn't just a once-off greeting. The friendliness that we felt from so many people and just drew us into the family. And in this year, more recently, um, we had a, a, a burglary and, the, again, members of our life group and so on gave, just gave, brought us a meal. And it was, there's not much you can do, but it was just a little act of, of love and kindness which really touched us. Um, I just, when Owen and I got COVID, um, our life group and our friends dropped meals off when we didn't have any energy to do that for ourselves. It was really touching in our vulnerability, how we were cared for. And there was a time when um, I couldn't get to fetch my child from school because of a commitment in Pretoria, and Jenny Jabre dropped my child off at home. She actually saw him looking a little bit lost and phoned me, and I was rushing, and she could actually drop my children off. Just practical love. Awesome. How's it, Chet? Um, yeah, for me, uh, we first visited you guys in 2006, 16th of December. I gave my heart to the Lord in this church. Um, if it wasn't for this church, my now wife, I don't know where she is, basically, with our twin boys, if it wasn't for this church, I wouldn't have had that because that night, my wife was, or my then girlfriend, was going to break it up with me. And the Lord saved me that night. And yeah, if it wasn't for this church, just uh, giving me love, wouldn't have been here now. Awesome. I see that hand. Okay. Um, I felt love in this church when um, there was sickness in my family. And uh, a sister of mine in here, Marie Claire, she stood with us in prayer. Um, there are some times when you're in a situation and you're just numb. I mean, you believe God can work miracles in your lives, but when you're in it sometimes, you, you might not even have the strength to do anything, not to even pray. But Marie Claire um, helped, helped our family, like uh, through prayer, she would come at home and um, pray with us. And to the extent that now she's practically family, um, she knows my kids, their birthdays, and she's just been a blessing to us. And I thank God for her. Thank awesome. you. So we can go on and on, but examples of love, speaking truth to someone, carrying someone's burden, counseling someone, the simple thing of buying them a gift, listening, doing chores for them, being a friend, being hospitable, praying for one another, dropping off a meal, serving one another, a phone call, a WhatsApp call. There are practical and beautiful ways that we can love one another. Remember, this is John at the end of his life. He's over 80. He's coming to the end of his life. And at the end of his ministry, people are carrying him to the different congregations, to the different house churches to speak. And they would carry him all the way to a, a small group. And it, was, it, is, it is tradition that he would say this. Little children, the, the place is packed. Last living apostle coming to hear the apostle John preach. And he says, little children, 
Love one another. Not a 25-minute sermon, not a 45-minute sermon. That, and, and, and it is said that someone complained about carrying him around all the time to just hear little children love one another. And it is said that John said back to them, if that's all they do, it is enough. That is the Lord's command. And if that only be done, that is enough. I was tempted today to stand up and say, little children or big children, adults, love one another. And this is my challenge to us. My challenge is a love does challenge. That you are going to think of tangible ways to express love to people every single week in this church. Uh, and I get it because I was brushing my teeth this morning going, oh, it's hard enough just loving my wife and my children and just trying to survive at the moment. Now you're asking me to come up with ways to love others that I'm journeying with. I'm trying to find romantic ways to just love my own wife. I need help, guys. I need some practical, fun examples. But what are some practical ways I can show love to people in this spiritual family? And I want to challenge you. I'm doing a love does challenge for the rest of the year and into next year. The people that are in your life group, the people that you know, every single week to think of a way that you can show love to that person in a practical way. If it is a hug and a word of affirmation, if it's going and serving them, you come up with whatever you want to come up with. But love, I want to end off by saying love is a verb. It is a doing word. Let us, let us not just talk about it. It's not just a nice warm feeling that we hopefully have for one another. It is a doing word. And Jesus is our example of what it means to love one another. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And God demonstrated his, his love for us by sending Jesus to die in my place. He laid down his life for us. And in chapter 4, someone is going to preach on this verse that says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us so much, we surely ought to love each other. So now you heard some examples of how people have loved them or how someone has loved you. I'm going to ask you as you go into the next few weeks and months that lie ahead, what, what is this post in this post-pandemic church? What are some of the things we are going to focus on as a church? What are some of the things we are going to do well? Here is one of them. We are going to focus on what it means to really love one another and lay down our lives for one another. Maybe less of the amazing worship and preaching, but church, if we can get this right, that verse says, by this, the world will know that you, my disciples, by how well your preacher preaches, or how well your band plays on a Sunday morning, or how good the scones are after the service. He says, by this, they will know that you belong to me by the way that you love one another. I'm going to ask you not to, and, and let's go back to that first example of the kidney story. The moment that thought went to my mind about giving a kidney, I went to good old me because the world revolves around me. Me, me, me. This Love Dare Challenge is sacrificing yourself and putting someone else above maybe your needs or your situation. How can I love you even when I'm not feeling the most loved? Someone sitting here today going, no one dropped a meal off for me when I had COVID. Right? 
My challenge to you is, will you do that for someone else when you hear that they've gone through, they've had a loss or they've had an issue or they've lost their job? Will you do that for someone else? When we love, we grow. This is what Jesus has called us to. So I want you to think of some practical ways to love each other in a practical way. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I'm going to close off in prayer. And then you've got homework to do. Because talking about it is easy. Preaching a sermon about loving one another is easy. Doing it is where it gets more challenging. If you can close your eyes and I'm going to pray and then we're going to close off with a song and then go and enjoy some fellowship together. Thank you, Father, that you so loved us that you demonstrated what love is, that you, Jesus, willingly laid down your life, and that, God, you tell us to do the same with our Christian brothers and sisters. And God, I don't want us just to talk theory. God, I want us to put this in practice. I want us to set self aside and all my own selfish desires and needs and to think about another person. And God, I want you to give us by your soul, oh, oh, pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be the one that would give us creative ways of showing love to one another. Pray, God, that it is your love that we have experienced that allows us to love our brother and sister in this church. Hebrews 10 says this, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. This is my verse I want us to end with. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Lord, won't you give us examples of ways that we can love one another in this place. Amen? Amen. Or oh my, or oh me. <clears throat> Won't you stand with us? We're going to sing a song that talks about His love. May we have great encounters with the love of God and then take that love and give it to others. I want to just say, if you're not connected to a life group or a small group, this is what I believe church is about. It's gathering together, but it's also meeting in homes and, and doing life together. That's a practical way that you can be loved and love others. So let's sing, sing this song, One Thing Remains, and let's sing about Father's love for us this morning.